Thank you for coming. Now, I mean, first of all, uh, when we think of Ottoman artisans, we think of guilds. And the question is, what do we mean by that? And I mean, for a while, it was quite customary to say, to discuss as to whether or not the Ottoman guilds resembled European guilds and in what sense they didn't. I think that question by now is not really that much in the foreground anymore, especially since people have been working on organ artisan organizations the world over. And for instance, come up with people who work on Japan have found that well, they had artisan organizations, but they were more like common enterprises. That is, people put in money, and putting in the money kind of made them into a group. Well, I mean, that happened also among Ottoman artisans. Uh, when they put their money together, for instance, to buy a, a dyer's vat, which had to be of copper, and copper was not cheap. So a couple of people would get together, or they would rent these things. And again, I mean, we find cases where this group of people who ha owns or rents these implements will decide about as to whether a certain person can be a member or not. So, I mean, it's not that common that they throw at somebody, but it does occasionally happen. And then, of course, the issue comes, what do you do with the money that this person has invested? Presumably, you have to pay it back. So, I mean, therefore, I said today, we don't normally look just exclusively at Ottoman and European guilds, we look at a wider framework, and then especially the Japanese case, I mean, becomes quite relevant. Uh, on the other hand, for instance, in India, there is no such organization to be found before the 19th century. And I mean, when you talk to Indian historians, uh, they'll tell you that. So I mean, it's, these organizations are not universal but they are fairly widespread, and they have a tendency kind of to resemble each other. Now, one thing that they all try to do, if they can, is to limit membership and to limit it to those people that they approve of. Well, for that, I mean, you don't need to be an a 17th century artisan. I had a friend in a city planner back in Middle East Technical University, and she used to make jokes about the guild mentality of architects, who kind of, although you know we were living in Ankara in the 70s and 80s, but yes, I mean they also had a kind of clannishness and an attempt to monopolize certain activities. And my friend, being a city planner, could see that they were doing this and make jokes about it. So I mean, the tendency to limit the activity of the craft to people that the others approve <coughs> of, this is something fairly widespread. Uh, I mean, in Ottoman guilds, it's not that common that somebody gets thrown out. But it does happen occasionally, as I told you a minute ago. Now, I mean, one of our problems is we do need some kind of a definition for the Ottoman case. My suggestion is to say that if a group is capable of making a complaint as a group or writing to the sultan or turning to the court, both these things are possible, and then I would recognize them as a group.
then normally they will have guild officials. I mean, from the 17th century onwards, certainly. But whether they had them all the time is anybody's guess. I mean, uh, it is rather tricky. In the earliest 16th century documents, we don't see these people. Uh, so therefore, maybe the organization emerged gradually and in the course of the 16th century. Well, this is, again, hypothetical and disputed. There are some people that assume that the medieval uh, organization of the Ahis is kind of the ancestor of the Ottoman guilds. But, well, I, you know, maybe I'm very skeptical and I don't think that we can prove the connection. Maybe it existed, but when something remains unproven, it's better to say maybe it's, you know, a hypothesis. Suppose this supposition, okay? So when these people get together and complain, then, I mean, I would say that uh, they are an organization and they will try to prevent outsiders from exercising the craft. Of course, for that, they will have, they, they need a language. And the language is always that non-members are clumsy, that they are not properly trained, that their workmanship is poor, and that uh, therefore, you know, it's a disadvantage to the customers. Well, I mean, it's, I think, important to see that this is a justifying discourse. It may be true in some situations and not so true in others. I mean, it may sometimes be a device for excluding certain people. I mean, we find, for instance, that some young masters find it very difficult to set up shop in the center of town. And Inaltic showed that, for instance, in Bursa, they might set up subsidiary clusters of shops somewhere on the outskirts of the city. So, I mean, it's uh, possible uh, that some of these humdest were not really clumsy <laughs> at all, but simply people whom the established guild masters did not wish to include. Okay, uh, so this is, of course, something that, you know, we find in European guild history as well. I mean, the famous or infamous masterpiece, uh, which came to be, in many cases, so expensive that many journeymen just couldn't afford the expense and therefore stayed journeymen long after they could have become masters. So, I mean, the, in the Ottoman world, we didn't have a masterpiece, but the, the masters had to get together and okay this person. And for instance, this is fairly well documented in Sarajevo, uh, where we have a lot of material. And there, apparently, the masters really got together and you know, officially made uh, their former journeymen into masters, and there's a record of this. So one, uh, you know, one of our problems, of course, is also that our documents talk basically and mainly uh, about things that are under dispute. That is, you know, people go to the court not when things are more or less, you know, going uh, according to plan, but when there is a dispute about something. And since normal, everyday, workaday routines are rarely documented, uh, it's possible to assume that these people spent their time in court, which I think 
cannot have been the case. Because, I mean, and that's what we always need to keep in mind, these people made very little money. They were, on the whole, even those who produced valuable goods, were often quite poor. I mean, in the case of the people who made these beautiful Iznik faiences, we know that they lived in great poverty, and presumably in other cases it was true as well. So these people just didn't have the time and energy to go to court all the time. Basically, they were trying to make a living and feed themselves and their families. And that must have been the main concern for the majority of the crafts. So, I mean, on the other hand, when our we look at our documentation, we find that there is really not very much reference to the market at all. And I mean, that I think has contributed to this very one-sided view of, you know, guilds that spend their time litigating and complaining and turning to the divan and getting answers, hopefully. Uh, because, I mean, uh, the market doesn't enter very obviously because, I mean, you all have I'm sure, heard of the administered prices. And there's a famous document uh, that Professor Pitukolo has edited from the middle of the 17th century. And it, it, it gives the prices of all sorts of goods that were sold in the Istanbul market. OK. But, I mean, this is a unique document. We don't have any other document that is that detailed, which means that it's anybody's guess whether many such registers were really made. I mean, especially when you go into the provinces, uh, these, these administrative prices were often entered into the judges' registers and they're only this long. I mean, uh, maybe 20, maybe 15 types of goods have an administered price. And I would say, I mean, in a city of 10,000 or 20,000 people, there must have been more things being bought and sold. Presumably, on the basis of these administrative prices, uh, people, the guildsmen agreed on sale prices among themselves, and because they did this among themselves, and probably they didn't write it down at all, unless somebody uh, started to dispute. Uh, and then, therefore, I mean, we don't know anything about it, and we always have to keep in mind that most of our information, like 80 or 85 percent of what we know, relates to Islam. I mean, and then in addition, there is something on Bursa, there is something on Aleppo, there's a bit on Damascus, there's something on Sarajevo, but if you ask me what was going on in the market of Diyarbakir in the 16th century, we don't have any information. And yet, these people were producing. I mean, uh, there is a very interesting article by Julian Raby who showed that in Diyarbakir and in this area in the 16th century, they were producing rather handsome faience panels, which look a bit like the Iznik panels, but they don't have the red. And they are on the whole rather more modest. But I mean, when you use, they, I, I, Happened to see one of them. In, uh, there is a little town uh, called Hanover, which has uh, in uh, it's near the Canadian border in New Hampshire, and this museum has a very nice faience fountain panel, which was dedicated by a certain Abdul Halim Effendi, 
and who had the inscription written both in Arabic and in Turkish. So it's assumed probably, you know, what's today northern Syria or southeastern Anatolia. And as I said, I mean, Jordan Arabia has found many more. So there was apparently a flourishing manufacture of t tiles and faience pots in or around Diabaka, and we know zero zilch about the people who did this. And I mean, this, therefore, I mean, uh, we have to be very cautious and not say that what's not recorded didn't exist. Because every now and then, we, you know, we find little bits and pieces. And then, for instance, we always assume, and rightly so, that yes, some women were active in the production, but they weren't organized. Well, that was true for the, for the vast majority, but our Greek colleagues found an 18th century women's guild in Thessaly. I think if I'm not totally mistaken, they made soap. And the rule was that to enter the guild, you had to be the daughter or the daughter-in-law of a guildswoman. And I mean, huh, I mean, it cropped up. I, I, as I said, I wouldn't have even noticed this, but one of my group friends told me that this existed. And yes, sure enough, there is a reference uh, to this in Astraha's uh, economic history. So, I mean, as I said, we can, we find things all over the place, and very often the pieces that people produced are the main guide to the existence of certain crafts. And again, I mean, in the Benaki Museum uh, in Athens, you will find uh, embroideries for the Orthodox Church, which are dated from the late, the earliest from the late 16th century, and it goes through the 17th into the 18th. And the women who either embroidered them or sponsored them, or maybe both, they give their names. So again, I mean, we wouldn't know about this activity at all if it weren't for these inscriptions on those embroideries. And the same thing is true for first certain kinds of silverware. I mean, when you go to the Sandakan uh, Museum, you will find there is a catalog of the silver work that they have, and you will see that there are guilds that we haven't even heard about in our documents, in our archival documents, that donated a piece of silver to some local church. And those pieces that wound up in the South Dakota Museum have been very well catalogued, and the inscriptions read. And so that's how all this came out. So, you know, therefore, I think that we need to look very carefully at what people produced. And it's for that purpose that I have brought these pictures. Now, these things, for instance, as you can see, uh, I mean, they wound up in a uh, German collection already in the 17th century. <laughs> which means that, you know, we, we know that they were produced before that date, probably in the 17th century. And this was something that for Izmir, for, I'm sorry, for Bursa, was really a lifesaver because the heavy, high-quality palace-type silks at that time were no longer being made and no longer in demand. And people for the longest time assumed that the silk industry just died. And then, I mean, Heim Gerber, who worked with the registers, showed that that wasn't true, that there were still lots of silk workers around in 17th century Bursa. Question, what did they live on? Here it is. I mean, they, these things were not palace quality. 
they are not that big. Again, the Sabek Hanu Museum has some fine pieces, this big, like mini carpets, mm -hmm. carpets for the person whose pockets are not that deep, mm -hmm. but very attractive, the best ones. And that was one of the things that kept Bursa going into the early 19th century, because we have the account of an Austrian diplomat who was also a scholar, uh, Joseph von Hammer, who visited Bursa in 1804. And he says that a huge number of these things were being sold, I mean, made in Bursa and sold as late as the time, you know, the period of Selim the, the Third. So, I mean, and again, I mean, uh, people have ignored these testimonies for the longest time. But now that uh, a young scholar by the name of Amanda Phillips has done a dissertation on these cushion covers, uh, of course, I mean, we know much more about this. Now let's see the next one. Now, this one, the reason why I show this to you is because it explains something that those of you who have seen the work of Nuhan Atasoy and Lale Uluc, you will know, will know that a lot of Ottoman silks survived not in Turkey, but in Poland and especially in Russia. And I mean, uh, usually this was because somebody uh, donated the silk and Either it was already made into a coat in Istanbul or Bursa, we don't know, or it was made into a coat once uh, the, the piece arrived uh, in Moscow. I mean, the, in Moscow you have splendid documentation because they wrote down everything that arrived as a gift to the Tsars. Uh, and there, there are several catalogs with lots of information on this. One of them beautifully illustrated, but I want to share a joke with you that found its way into this uh, catalog. Somebody says, and he's a distinguished art historian, that the Ottoman sultans were very much imbued with their own dignity, and they never received foreign ambassadors that was the job of the Grand Vizier, and he did this in Izmir. Now, can you imagine such a thing? In Izmir, you know, this was long before planes circulated between Istanbul and Izmir. So obviously, it could not be right. And of course, the, you know, it's just a mistake from beginning to end because, the, the, you know, like the Sultan did receive foreign ambassadors at the beginning and at the end of this day. He didn't speak to them. That's a different story. When they negotiated, they negotiated with the Grand Vizier. But all this happened in the talk of the Sarai. And I always imagine the Grand Vizier jumping back and forth between Izmir and Istanbul every time an ambassador turned up. I mean, it's, it's crazy. But this found its way into a beautifully produced and printed catalog, which means that we all must be very cautious and very humble because we see things like that when other people do them, but who knows what happens to us? Huh? I mean, Okay. Now, this is something a lot more modest, because so far we have been looking at maybe medium-priced, but still valuable silks. This is something quite pretty, namely, uh, in Topane in the 19th century, there functioned a manufacturer that basically produced tobacco pipes, and any number of them and in addition, also coffee cups. And they are really made of you know, very modest clay, but nicely decorated with inscriptions and also with fake turas. 
you know, uh, a fake tura, you know what that is? It's called the Kuyumju turas. Uh, and it's meant to decorate, but it isn't really the tura of any sort. Well, I don't know enough about turas to distinguish one from the other, but I have, happen to have a friend who is very expert in this, and he looked at that stuff and then laughed and said, no, this is an invented tura. But the point is, you know, you can see this is very late because the cup has a handle. The earlier cups don't. You know, they, they were put into a metal holder, a zarf, and uh, some of them couldn't even stand, some of them could. And the handles become fashionable quite late in the 18th century and then in the 19th. So this is obviously a 19th century production. But the reason why I like to dwell on it is because it shows you that there people could have nice things made out of very modest materials because it's painted, it's decorated, it has a kuyumju turas, it has an inscription, and yet it's visibly something relatively modest. Well, something else mm, is still of that sort is found in the museum of a little place called Ambras, which is an, really on the outskirts of Innsbruck, uh, I mean in the south of Austria, where there is a collection that was put together in the late 16th century by a prince of the Habsburg family who never became emperor or anything. In fact, he married a lady that uh, his father didn't approve of. And so he was kind of afaros, and, but he had money. And he made this fancy collection, including Ottoman things. And, so this, and the nice thing is he had all this catalog. And he died in the 1590s, and one catalog was made shortly after his death. Some catalogs were made while he was still alive. The catalogs are all dated, and so we know when these pieces arrived. And one of the things that they have in Andras, which I've never seen before or since, is little wooden plates that were painted with very attractive Ottoman designs, you know, tulips, carnations, the rest. And they were visibly never used in Andras, so they're still in fairly good condition. Well. I mean, uh, you can see, again, a wooden plate is something very modest. But the decoration shows that, you know, somebody wanted something recherche, and sure enough, he got it. Okay, and now, we don't have many images showing people actually at work. And I have quite consciously not brought the tsunami because I'm sure you've, most of you have seen it many times. And the point of the tsunami is really, it's not to show actual shops. Uh, I don't know whether some of you have ever been in countries where carnival is celebrated. And at carnival, people have floats usually on top of lorries. And they will show all sorts of images, including images making fun of politicians. I mean, I grew up in Bonn, uh, and Cologne has a famous carnival to the present day. And they had plenty of these floats. In my childhood, they also existed in Bonn. I don't know whether they still do, but in Cologne, they still exist. Well, I mean, those floats, in Cologne were showpieces. They were not, not meant to show anything realistic. And in the same way, these Ottoman pieces in the tsunami were meant to be showcases. They were not meant to show an actual workshop, which I'm sure was never as clean and tidy and orderly as you know the shops shown in the procession. In fact, sometimes not. In Ankara, the 
in the CGS, in the color registers, I once found declarations of witnesses saying the butcher shop of XYZ smells bad. It's impossible to, to be there because of the bad smell. And then all sorts of people who witnessed this fact. Well, I'm sure that's true. I mean, that happens in butcher shops. Uh, but when you look at the tsunami, of course, that is not the topic. So therefore, I mean, uh, you have to take these and all of these things as images, not as real things. Well, this one shows a, a, a tenor. It was, you know, it was made in the 1870s, which means after the invention of photography. But apparently, Bulgaria in the 1860s and 70s uh, had not many roads, and photograph the apparatus for photography was still very fra fragile. So this guy did it the old way. That is, he drew. And then he had an engraving or a lithography made on the basis of his drawings. And I mean, the interesting thing is that you see that in the foreground, you see the Tana at work. And if you look carefully in the background is his aide who is hanging up the skins to dry. And I mean, not anymore, but in Safranburg, Back in the 1970s, they still they had some of the old tannery buildings still standing, and they had on the upper floor huge terraces, which were meant for the exact same purpose, namely to hang the skins to dry after they had been finished. Uh, I went there recently once again, and these buildings had disappeared but I remember very well seeing them approximately 30, 35 years ago. On this same collection is, it's a family of work. And I mean, that again is, I think, something that we have to keep in mind. I mean, some people didn't work in workshops, but rather at home and then their wives and daughters and uh, you know all got to share in the work. So this person is making something called gaitan, which is a braid that is sewn onto kaftans. And I mean, if, if you go to the South Dakota Museum, you see very fancy kaftans. But I mean, you can hear, you, this is very modest stuff. And you can see that the men and their wives and daughters are all working together. I mean, we have a similar image for Greek peasants making cotton cloth, where it's again, you know, a family, uh, somebody's cleaning the cotton, somebody spins, uh, somebody weaves. So, I mean, again, uh, this is an aspect that we need to keep in mind. Well, and here now, because time is running out, uh, are some of the fancy pieces. Uh, these are, you know, very fine pieces, highly decorated, very sophisticated, and you can see lots of red, because apparently red was the favored color, at least in the 17th century and in the early 18th, because we have reports of uh, French and English merchants who were trying to sell woolen fabrics. And they tell us again and again that if you want to uh, you know, uh, make a good sale, then you should stock up on red. Uh, I mean, that's what they like, especially in Syria. That's what the Englishman experienced. And the Frenchman said the same thing also for this part of the world. Apparently, it wasn't that way in the middle of the 16th century. Because we have a list by an uh, ambassador by the name of Busbeck, uh, who was at the court of Kanuni. And he has all sorts of colors that were favored, 
but certainly not red. Uh, but so really, we don't quite know whether he just missed out on something possible, or whether fashions changed. I mean, the question mark. Okay, and here we have another one slightly later, uh, and I think it comes out a little better. Uh, and you can see these stylized tulips. Now, this is somewhat tricky, because when you look at early 18th century tulip books, and there are quite a few of them, they all say that a good tulip should be red, preferably, and that it should have very thin pointed leaves, the petals, I'm sorry. And it, the uh, most expensive variety is the Nisei Romani, uh, which has petals so thin that they almost look like the teeth of a comb, I mean. And yet, when we look at textiles, they don't show that. I mean, the, the, uh, in the early 18th century, this was definitely, you know, considered a proper sort of tulip. In fact, there were even committees that were like, you know, contests as to who could grow the most interesting tulip. And then, I mean, uh, they wrote down the criteria. There's a gentleman by the name of Mehmet Lalezari who produced a whole treatise on what makes a distinguished tulip. But when you look at the, the tulips on textiles, they don't resemble the tulips in the tulip books one bit. And I don't know why and how, but I suspect it may have been because often you want to decorate the inside of the tulip, see, here. And you can't do that if the tulip is very thin. I mean, it, there just isn't any space. So maybe the tulips became more rounded on textiles uh, because uh, the designers wanted an ornamented tulip. And never mind about you know what the cultivators of tulips said and wrote. They apparently uh, just ignored this. And this one is also something very interesting. It comes from the island of Kiosakus. And Succus, in the late 17th century, came into being as a silk center. It hadn't had been before that. And the great time of Succus was the 18th century. And then it disappeared. I mean, but uh, there are quite a few pieces. And Hulia Tesjan, uh, who is, you know, one of the great connoisseurs of Ottoman textiles, she once wrote an article about the so-called Danga Isakus, which is the stamp of the tax collectors. Uh, only then mm, we made a couple of jokes among ourselves because there is a young colleague by the name of Yuxel Duman who wrote a dissertation about Tokat, which was a place where they produced printed cottons. And these people had stamps to stamp the cotton. And when they ran out of options, they faked the stamps of the, of the tax collectors. And I mean, he found documents in the sigil showing that that apparently was not a rare occurrence. And of course, when I told this story to Juliana, she said, oh my god, I just hope that this didn't spread because we are, you know, we tend to trust these dangas. Let's hope that this was a top up they would take you here. Well, I mean, uh, so you can, see, you can see that these, these pieces uh, throw up a whole lot of questions. And I mean, one of them is also that these arches with little columns, uh, well, we associate that with prayer rocks. 
And yes, I mean, there were many prayer rugs with just that design. But it was apparently also popular among non-Muslims. And if you go onto the homepage of the Textile Museum in Washington, you will find a Torah curtain, which has a very similar design. And we know who commissioned it. And it was made for a certain synagogue. And it has a very similar design. So obviously, I mean, uh, people thought who people who have studied this stuff have thought that maybe because Jewish printed books often had such a design on the cover that that was how it spread. Possible. But then, I mean, we will see that we also find it among Armenians. And as you probably know, a couple of years ago, uh, the textiles in the possession of the Armenian Patriarchate in Kumkapa were published. And the book is available. I mean, you go to Yem Kitapeve in Besiktash, and they sell it. Mm. And there you will see that a very similar design in the 18th century was also popular for the decoration of Armenian churches. So the design, which started out as a Sejade design, apparently was imitated across religions, at least in the 18th century. Well, I mean, as I said, these kinds of the issues, uh, we can only try to approach. Very often, we can just ask a question. Uh, we can't really answer, as you may have noticed from what I told you, uh, that a lot of the time, <coughs> it's a question without an answer. But you can see that there is a great deal to be learned just by looking very carefully at the various pieces that these people produced. And I mean, that was really my playboy way in a sense, that namely, that people uh, made their products for a larger public. It wasn't just the palace, uh, there was a probably not very broad layer of people who had some money, not much, but some. And they, they did possess the cushion covers that you have seen. In Bursa in the early 18th century, we find women with five silk dresses in their sandal. Uh, well, these were probably not of the highest quality, uh, but I mean, they were surfaces all right. So, I mean, we have a probably not very broad layer of people who could afford things that are kind of second quality, not palace quality, but that are, you know, reasonable, quite fancy, and as you have seen, there were also things that you could buy if you had very little money, but you wanted, you still <coughs> wanted something uh, recherché. And, you know, the topane coffee cups or the wooden plates that uh, are still in Andras, uh, well, they show you, you know, that there were people of probably moderate incomes, the really poor wouldn't have afforded this anyhow, but people of some resource that did own and did want these things, which means that there was a, a market and that these people were producing for the market. And okay, I mean, uh, it, therefore, I would suggest that we always need to look at the material remnants, the things that these people produce, always keeping in mind that the losses are enormous. Because if you think of the migrations that happened in the late 19th and in the especially earlier part of the 20th century, people being chased back and forth 
uh, from the Balkans into Anatolia and from Anatolia into Greece and on it went. Well, most of these people lost what they had, either because they, could, they needed to sell it to keep body and soul together, or because these things were stolen, or because they were too heavy to carry. I mean, there's a very nice story about this little town of Sinassos, where one of the churches had fancy crystal, uh, you know, uh, lamps, and they collected oral history, and one of these people said, well, we couldn't take them all. So when we were due to go, we took those that we could take, and one of the, these lamps I gave to the, the local imam. He was going to make this church into a mosque, and I said, well, hi, little soon, here is the lamp. So, I mean, you can see that mm, uh, a lot of things moved and then were lost in one way or another, and that probably happened more to the goods of more modest people, because very often uh, those who were somewhat wealthy could see it coming and could leave before things got really rough. But if you got caught, you know, in something like the exchange of populations, or before that, you know, after uh, 1912, well, then you were liable to lose everything. And that explains, you know, why we have such a skewed understanding of the production that happened, for instance, in the 18th century. Well, I mean, uh, as I said, uh, there are many other things that one could talk about. And if you are interested, I mean, uh, you're welcome to look at these summaries. But, I mean, I have been, basically what happened was that after finishing this book, I got, to, I got interested in material culture, mainly because I'm teaching a course on the subject. And, uh, well, I mean, once you get into this, uh, it's, it's really, it comes to be an obsession. I mean, it's, it's really quite amazing. And I wanted to share that with you, and not just give you a summary of the book, which, after all, is there. And, you know, if you want to look, you can. And thank you for your attention. <laughs>